The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. As we begin this morning, <clears throat> sharing from the Word of God on Easter, uh, I like to start with the words of Jesus and also to mention that all of the words of Jesus, when he said, I am the resurrection and the life, he who believes in me, though he may die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Interesting. He said, do you believe this? because I am the resurrection. I've spent my entire Christian walk with anything that God says he was, I wanted to know it experientially. And probably the one thing that I believe he's speaking right now currently uh, with physical healing and knowing him as the healer is that this same God that raised Jesus from the dead will also quicken or give life to your death doomed body or mortal body. How many know that mortal means death doomed? I mean, it's ultimately going to go someday. But yet God wants to give life, resurrection life, to this death-doomed body. Two kinds of life. There's a suke life, life of the flesh, and then there's the life of the spirit. But something that uh, has been on my heart lately is that, uh, and we share this often, uh, that there is a going to be kind of a collision course on what I believe is going to be the difference between people that are seeking after power and people that ha are going to have the resurrection life that's going to move toward character. And in the, I think it was the early 80s, uh, we used to have uh, prophetic people come and visit my church uh, in Pennsylvania. And when they were done ministering, they would hand me a form as a pastor to evaluate them. I'd like to see that returned. I know if the people that we have that we've ever sent forth, we've given them instruction sheets under full stature ministry so that when they go to a visiting church, you know, they're not just a fly by night and they're held accountable. Wouldn't you feel good if you were a pastor or even a member of a congregation to know that some guest speaker came, left a form for evaluation for that pastor to send back to someone? In other words, there was a, a level of accountability. And haven't taught on this in years, but this is the, uh, like I said, in the early 80s, I used to fill these forms out regular because we used to have prophetic ministry come to our, my church. And usually they were recommended by peers, people that, that uh, you trust their opinions. But nonetheless, I felt very secure that they would hand out this form and it was the 10 M's by which to evaluate. I think we got to get back to, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did I not prophesy? Did I not cast out demons? And he's going to say, depart from me, I knew you not. But there's a, there's a safety mechanism, and that is evaluating the character of the prophet, not just the prophecy. Don't you think? And these 10 M's, I just wanted to cover them to you because I believe this applies to everybody. This doesn't just apply to a guest speaker coming in. This applies to the days ahead to where we evaluate not just gifting, but the character that goes in with it. So... I'm going to give it to you in the order it was always given to me when they would come. And this is the way I evaluated them. The 10 M's. The 10 M's. So this message, yes, there's 10 of them. And, and you're going to be counting, oh, he's only on number two. He's on number three. Okay. But in reality, I want you to really write this down because this is something that if God's going to bring a church to full stature, and if Resurrection Sunday isn't just for Sunday, once a year. Resurrection life is to give quicken to give life to that mortal body and that's going to be something that we're supposed to walk in that life the zoe life there's suke life and there's zoe life there's suke life is the natural life the life of the flesh but there's the zoe life the life of god and the only way you get the life of god is from god inside and and the reality of a conversion experience so anyway uh determining true ministry by using the 10 m's are you ready for it? 
am number one. And this is good for young ministers, uh, missionaries, uh, anybody with a, with a passion uh, for ministry, but also for any believer because you're in the marketplace and that's your, that's your mission field. You know, actually, when you leave this building, there should be a sign out there like I had in my first church. There was a sign we had, you are now entering the mission field. This is just a time of fellowship, worship, celebration, time where you come together and like precious faith. But once you leave this door, that's where it begins. And the first M of the 10 is manhood. God makes the man before manifesting mighty ministry. He that has ears to hear, let him hear what he's saying. He builds the man or the woman of God before he releases ministry. And many people have the cart before the horse. All they talk is ministry, 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 but the character development's not there. It's almost to the point where the church doesn't even mention it anymore. They're looking at the gifting. Did I not prophesy? Did I not cast out devils? I don't know, but God makes the man before manifesting mighty ministry. He said, let's make man according in our image, according to our likeness. It tells me that he cares about the man and the woman of God. Man, apart from position, apart from the message, or apart from the ministry. Do you know, I used to evaluate that. I would evaluate them apart from their position or title, apart from the message that they preached, apart from their ministry. It was basically, what's the man like? Has the man got character? Has the man got the kind of uh, Christ-likeness? Um, personality is personality. Basically evaluating the person, not performance. And I hear amen on the person, not performance. Because people look at performance. Jesus' manhood, if you want to use him as an illustration, Jesus' manhood was developed over a 30-year period, 30 years in the making of the man. By the Spirit of God, he made that man. He grew in wisdom, even by the things that he suffered. He grew in character. For 30 years, his ministry was three and a half years. Does that to tell you anything right there? That the making of the man is a primary over the ministry. The second M, ministry itself. 2 Corinthians 6.3 says, We give no offense in anything that our ministry may not be blamed. There was many things that we saw in ministry that basically gave offense. Uh, I know uh, my spiritual father said, There's one fellow I'm not taking to the mission field anymore with me, no matter how gifted he is. Uh, took him to Japan, and he wouldn't take his cowboy boots off when he entered the house. All right? Because it was inconvenient. But there's something wrong with the character when you have that attitude when you're in a foreign country, isn't it? I don't care how gifted you are. There's something in the heart that needed work on. My spiritual father said he'd take me anywhere, and he did. So I must have behaved. The only thing he complained about was I talked too much, especially when he wanted to go to bed. He wanted to sleep. So apparently, just the person of Dennis was at least sufficient to go with a seasoned missionary who had been a missionary since the early 50s in the Philippines and elsewhere. Um, so ministry, by their fruits you shall know them. It doesn't say by their power gifts you shall know them. It says by their fruits you shall know them. Uh, is there results? You know, is there some kind of a uh, good? First Corinthians 2, as far as your ministry. And I like this. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and power. Most people think strictly in the gifts, in demonstration of the Spirit and power. You're thinking, Phew, people got s saved, healed, and all of those things. Yes, that's part of it. But it also says in the Amplified Bible, it talks about moral power and excellence of soul. We don't hear people talk much about that. Moral power. How about some moral power? How about some ability to be Christ-like? Let's have that the preaching included moral power and, and the, as the Amplified says, excellence of soul. What would that mean? Excellence of character. Excellence of, 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 of a kind of person. Not just what they said, not just what they did. So ministry... 
the prophecies or the preaching was productive, it was proven, it was poor, uh, poor, pure, it could be poor too, but pure, positive. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, who speaks in my name of other gods, that prophet will die. Whoa, there's a, there's a, there's a warning in speaking those things that are not coming from the heart of God. So there's a responsibility that comes with it. That's Deuteronomy 18.20. So ministry needs to not bring offense. Prophetic ministry primarily should be to comfort, edify, and encourage. Uh, I've heard some pretty wacky prophecies that didn't have any of that in it. Anybody else ever hear any prophecies? If you're watching by Ustream, have you ever heard prophetic words that was basically doom and gloom and nothing redemptive in it? You know, there's warnings, there's admonitions, but by golly, there's always uh, a redemptive solution. If I can't find a redemptive solution in it, I think sometimes I think it's just doom and gloom. And sometimes it's coming from people's fears. So ministry is the second M. The third M is the message. The message. To speak the truth in love. You present truth and it's life-giving. The message is balanced. I used to have to evaluate these with, uh, to send it back into the home office of the guest speaker to be evaluated by his peers. But it was, was the message balanced? Was it scriptural? Was it doctrinally sound and spiritually right? God confirms his word, not the person, pride, or reputation. That's what the message needs. Does the message bring results that change lives? That's the ultimate test for a word. Is the word change lives? Do, do you leave with a transformation? Does it lead you to a redemptive purpose? Does it bring peace into your life? Because all of the doctrines of Jesus are doctrines that lead to peace. Peace with God, peace with yourself, peace with others. So it's the confirmation that comes from the message not the person pride or reputation that's the third M the message what is the content of the message how many believe that that uh, kingdom life full stature ministries that the message is basically includes the work of the cross do you believe that because that's oftentimes when the message is incomplete they found I'm okay, you're okay, everybody's okay, and just kind of waters it down. The message of the cross must be that God died on that cross. We're celebrating resurrection. By the way, without a resurrection, there really isn't any Christianity. There's no purpose for Christianity uh, apart from the resurrection. And if that resurrection life produced life, this is eternal life, John 17, 3, that they might know me, that there is a place for intimate knowledge with resurrection life and that it will quicken or give life to your death-doomed body. I like that word mortal. To your mortal body, that means that death-doomed body, there is resurrection life, and that this is life that you might know Him. So it's not even living forever as much as it's knowing Him is real eternal life. That's Zoe life. That's the God kind of life. So speak a message that decrees and declares that, that speaks life. The fourth M, maturity. Maturity means they're not childish. Though I speak with the tongue of men and angels, but have not love, I become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. Uh, God's looking for mature. As a matter of fact, he says, don't ordain quickly. Do not lay hands on anyone quickly. Because novices get puffed up with pride and they're more concerned about how they look and how they appear than the message that they're giving. So maturity is necessary. That needs to be the fruit of the Spirit. There needs to be Christ-like character. They need to be dependable, steadfast. The lack of maturity shows that We've taken our biblical knowledge, but maturity is not biblical knowledge alone. It's the kind of bi biblical knowledge that we own to such a degree that we're not tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. That's a sign of childishness. Childishness is still tossed to and fro. They haven't really gotten their, 
their feet rooted or grounded in the things of God. They can be moved very easily. They can be upset very easily. They have thin skin, so to speak, in the church. You know, on the one hand, we need to bring healing to the wounded body of Christ. But on the other hand, there are a lot of people that never get healing because they're too busy living in offenses. Part of the message of the gospel means we're going to give you the tools to deal with your issues and die to your agendas, and then you can mature. You can avoid those and never really make it. So maturity. Actually, that's Jennifer and I's calling. We were called to the body at large, and we were called to the purpose of maturity. We are the opposite of mothering you and holding your hand and babying you. We're basically desiring to make you feel comfortable and secure, but then ultimately we want to unpack you. We want you to see the potential that's on the inside. And if you're never tested, you never find out what's inside of you. Do you know that? And there's a lot of people don't know what they would do in a difficult situation. They haven't been in a difficult situation yet. But I'll tell you what, it will show you what's in there. And when you stand strong, steadfast in circumstances, patient with people, you will find out that, you know, you're going you're gonna to like yourself better because you're going to see that you did have the potential in there. But you don't know it until it's been tested. You know, I hated basic training in the Army. I wanted out. I, didn't, I wasn't a Christian, but I prayed that God would get me out. <laughs> and he didn't. And then after you made it, I was glad he didn't. Because then I did it, just like tens of thousands of other people. And hundreds of thousands have done it. So did I. But at the same time, it, you didn't feel that way until it was over. Then you look back and you go, wow, I'm glad I did that. Don't want to do it again. <laughs> huh? But that's the unpacking for the purpose of maturity. God doesn't want you to be a novice. He doesn't want you to be tossed to and fro. He wants you to be able to stand when hard times come. He doesn't want you to collapse and fall apart. The fifth, element, the fifth M, the marriage. Scripturally in order, personal family versus God's family. Blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, good behavior, hospitable, and able to teach. And often said that, uh, that if these are character qualities, you just don't look at the external. There's something more important than just having one wife. It's a, are you a one woman man? Hmm? There's some people that have one wife and they got eyes that wander all over the place. It's, that's a character flaw. A one woman man is one who is singular toward the woman that God joined them with. So you look at their marriage. I can remember reviewing one of the prophets that came to, uh, came to my church, and I hesitated, but I had to admit that I felt like that even though he was a well-known prophet and very successful, I was concerned that his wife was um, suffering under the circumstances of his ministry. And it wasn't real serious, but it was enough to be concerned to where I'm very reluctant to write that. But I wrote down to his bishop that basically I felt like that they needed some time together, that he was gung-ho um, ministry, but she was kind of tra trailing behind, trying to homeschool the kids and do a bunch of other things. And I felt like he needed some, uh, some time and I just put a mild suggestion found out later that I wasn't the only one that was putting the same suggestion so they were all observing something in the marriage even if they couldn't put their finger on it multiple pastors were filling out their forms the same way there's something amiss with the marriage you don't put your ministry before your wife got me you don't put your business before your wife that's a major major flaw in 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 Christians and that M needs to be looked at in the area. Marriage is to exemplify the relationship of Christ and his church. Your priorities need to be God first, wife second, family, then ministry. Do you hear me? Those of you watching by Ustream, this is so common. I deal with this so often that it, it, it almost gets you weary. Ministry is not first. I'm watching people destroy their families because they're, they feel like they're called of God and then 
and then they're mad at God that he didn't support them financially. Did it ever occur to you that God guides where he, provi he provides where he guides, that perhaps you should be taking care of yourself? You don't work, you don't eat. Mm -hmm. I'm totally convinced that there needs to be effort on your part. There's too many people, quote, living by faith, and it's not faith at all. It's an entitlement mentality. But God's going to get this back and structured. If you're going to really minister for God, you better get your, you better get your life straight first, that it's God first, wife second, family, then ministry. That's just the proper order. I don't know why we don't like that. If you're that spiritual that you can bypass that order, that's scary to me. So start looking at, get your priorities straight. Your marriage is to exemplify the relationship. The way you treat your wife is the way you're going to treat your constituents. Aren't you? Got awful quiet. Those people on Ustream got real quiet. <laughs> the way you treat people is the way you treat God. The way you treat God is the way you treat people. If there's, a, if there's difficulty in the way you treat people in general, that's where there is, a, there is a problem the way you are in relationship with God. Because a lot of people say, oh, God, I love. It's these people I can't stand. That doesn't going to hold water in the long run. What God's saying is these attitudes you have toward people, it's also a barrier between you and God. All right? The sixth M, methods. Titus 1.16 says, They profess to know God, but in their works they deny him, being abominable, disobedient, disqualified for every good work. You know, rigidly righteous God wants ethical, honest, integrity, and upright. And I'll tell you what, I've seen in my entire life in ministry, I've seen a contrast between those who are marketing themselves with selfish ambition and have a hunger more for power than care about the people they're ministering to. They get confused between ministry, a love for ministry, and a love for the people because of the love of God inside. So it's real easy to look at methods, but a, a good, res, good end results does not justify unscriptural methods, does it? For if the truth of God is increased through my lie to his glory, why am I also still judged as a sinner? You know, good end results do not justify unscriptural methods. We used, to have to value, we used to have to evaluate any prophet that came to our church. We basically evaluated him as to his methodology. Because it's wonderful to have good prophetic giftings, but what, what, how did he behave in the church? What was his method? The seventh M, manners. Unselfish, polite, kind, a gentleman or a lady discreet I saw basically proper speech and communication and word and mannerism that was another criteria how did they interact with people um, you can be real good up on the platform and be terrible on a one on one with people can't you and God's basically looking for unselfish polite kind. Love is patient, love is kind, right? So if the ministry is really love motivated, there should be some kindness there somewhere. Don't, you can't say I love, but I'm just not kind. I love, but I'm not patient. I love, yeah, yeah. So manners are important. Proper speech and communication and words and mannerisms. The eighth M. How are they on the topic of money? Money is not evil, but the love of money is the root of all evil. Not craving wealth and resorting to ignoble and dishonest methods of getting it. Hmm? Love of money and materialism destroys. We've got Achan, we've got Balaam, we've got Judas. We saw that it can be used against you, can it? So the eighth thing is money. Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. 
So basically evaluate the minister based on their attitude toward money. Or can that be conveyed? Have, have you seen things in the church that had to do with money that upset you? That could mean two things. It could mean you have money issues <laughs> and any topic on money upset you. Or, <laughs> or there, was, there was an unkind manner or means to try to appropriate money. Right? That should be, they should be evaluated based on that, shouldn't they? You know, that's why I respect the, uh, it is such a sensitive subject, particularly for unbelievers, that really a lot of ministries are doing the wise thing is they don't ask for money because that's always thrown in their face. If you're a, a student of the Bible, you're supposed to want to give and know that what you give is because this is part of your way of declaring to God that he owned you and that everything is his. And you're giving a portion back to honor and be grateful for that. But many ministries won't even ask for money, but they're, they're basically the only way they can survive in a business atmosphere is to basically say, we have product. For your donation of X amount, we can. It's kind of sad that you can't. But there's such a lack of integrity and so much suspicion that you almost have to. Um, And for everyone that's doing it right, there's somebody that's doing it wrong. It's not the way life is, though. But it's for you. You judge, you judge your own heart. Let the Holy Spirit judge your own heart toward money matters. M number nine. Morality. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do you... Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, or sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body. But he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Now, Jennifer's dad was not even a believer. And he had some questions about sex and uh, morality. And... He read that portion of scripture as an unsaved person. He goes, well, that's clear enough. Was that confusing to anybody? <laughs> but they, but they want to make it confusing. Isn't that something? So an unsaved man reads it and goes, well, that's clear enough. As a matter of fact, what was that guy's name? Uh, Razor. Occam's Razor. Occam's Razor. Razor. He was a great theologian. And he came to the conclusion that if your argument is extremely convoluted and complicated, the simple version is the real thing. <laughs> so if something is that complicated, com like, like the, or, my drug buddies used to say that herb, God made the herbs of the field and he said they were good. <laughs> so I mean, you can do just about anything if you want to. And, and you know what? They, they had to justify it. But if you've really got to stretch it to justify it, and it's really convoluted and complicated, the simple answer is usually the right one. I thought that was pretty good for a theologian, don't you think? When did he live? He was in about the what? About the 1200s. He came to that conclusion that they're making it more complicated than it needs to be. We need a more steadfast devotion to Jesus and return to the simplicity that's in Christ. So anyway, morality. No wrong thoughts or desire to do without opportunity to act. But I say to you, whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Whoa. So this is, again, character quality. This has to do with the attitude of the heart. It's not even according to your action. And here's a case where we should judge ourselves. You know, we let ourselves off the hook. We judge other people by their actions, but we judge ourselves by our intentions. Oh, but I meant, I didn't mean, I didn't mean anything by it. Well, here's one. You can judge by your intentions. If a man even looks at a woman to lust, he's already committed. What was your intention? You know? God's looking for a body that's going to be clean. And he knows nobody's perfect, but he's made a provision. 
I mean, this is Resurrection Sunday. This is where he died that your sins could be forgiven. All you need to do is receive it as a free gift. You can't even earn it, and you can't do it yourself. It's one of those things that he does that you can't do, and that is forgive your sin. So, oh, it's not popular to talk about sin anymore. It's not popular to talk about the cross, and it's not, possible. It's not popular to talk about sexual immorality either. The last... M, motive. And this has probably, probably been something that I feel like God has helped me with over the years. Because discerning of spirits has to do with making a distinction between good, evil, and God. <laughs> you know, there's human spirits, there's evil spirits, and there's God's Holy Spirit. There's angels, there's demons, all right? But discernment is to identify the source along with making a distinction. And when you identify the source, you, you're actually dealing with motivation. And I still think that if all of us would cultivate that intimacy with God and pay more attention to our spirit, we would be more accurate in discerning the source or the true nature of something. Because people will fool you with their words and they'll fool you with your gestures, but you can't hide what emanates from the heart. And it will either show up on their words, regardless of how gracious the words are, but the source, the source, the source. Real discernment depicts the source, the nature that's attached to words. We've spent too much time evaluating words and gestures when we should have been evaluating the source of those words and the source of those gestures. So motive is, is important. Do you believe in, even as a believer, there are people who, who serve primarily to be seen and heard? Do you think there's such a thing as a need to be needed? They minister to people more for the need that it produces in them than they care about the person? Think about it. Because ultimately, if you're going to minister in kingdom ministry, it's not about being seen and heard. It's about doing as unto the Lord, whether anybody knows it or not. Whether you have a title or not. Are you fulfilling personal drive or God's desire? Actually, it even says that in Matthew 6, take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Who would you be doing that for then? To make yourself feel good or to make yourself look good to other people? motivated by God's love or is it lust for power, fame and making a name for yourself I think God's going to bring us to the place where you don't care who gets the credit as long as people are being helped, there's got to be a maturation to where we move from child to young man to fathers and mothers and this has nothing to do with your chronological age I believe in 1 John when God when, uh, when John spoke to the audience, he was speaking at spiritual level, regardless of their chronological age. Everybody in the room could have been 30 and over, but he would say, I speak to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven. In other words, what, isn't that the first thing you learn when you get saved, is that God loves me, and he give it, he'd get the gimmies. And that's not a bad thing, because he is your provider. But some people stay there forever, and their whole relationship with God is, what can he give me? That's when you haven't matured. But a young man, it says, but I speak to you, young men, because the word of God abides in you strong and you've overcome the wicked one. That's a notch up, isn't it? I speak to you, young men and women, because you've overcome the wicked one and the word of God abides in you. That means apparently you've matured and you're seasoned by reason of use. You can actually overcome. And actually people will go to you for help. You won't have to look for people to minister to. That's still need-based. And that's still a child, believe it or not. But they will come to you in many respects. Or you will go to them because you know the harvest is ripe. 
because of sensitivity of your spirit. I speak to you, young men, because you're instruments. The child thinks in terms of God is my source. Does he ever stop being your source? No. But you think most of the time, most of the time, the mindset is that God is my source. I have needs, and my God will supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. That's a truth, but that shouldn't be where your mindset should be all the time, should it? What is the goal of even the Lord's Prayer but to bring you back to the heart of the Father to honor him? So it's not just about what he can do for you. First time I heard that in my head in prayer, I heard the voice, it sounded like a guy with a Boston accent. I thought it was John F. Kennedy. He said, I heard it in my head with that Boston accent. You had asked not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. God basically said, ask not what God can do for you, but what you can do for your God. It should be, it should be as unto him. And I saw that 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 motive was, I speak to you, young men, because the word of God abides in you strong. But what I see young men even on television, what are they saying? Look what I can do. Is that wrong? No, it's not wrong. But there's something better than that. That which is better than that is not what I can do, but it's basically the heart of the father saying, rather than me going to the park and swinging on the swings, I find more joy in watching the kids swing on the swings. I'm more, it's more enjoyable to see the children standing on their own two feet and accomplishing. That is the heart of the Father. That would have been like John. That would have been like Paul. That would have been my son, Timothy. All right. No one has like-minded for all seek their own. That's a, that's a pretty large indictment, isn't it? All seek their own, not the things that are Jesus. So there must have been, even in the first century church, there was people that basically did it for themselves. He's saying, all seek their own, not genuinely the things that are Christ. So, Father, though you have 10,000 instructors and young instruments for God, men and women, you don't have many fathers or mothers. Though you have 10,000, and actually that word in the Greek for, uh, though you have 10,000 instructors, it's actually boy leaders. Do you know the Greeks were good at that? They would, they would bring young 20-somethings 20, 20 who could master the material and then they'd be instructing all ages. But you know what? They lack life experience, don't they? I don't care how well they know the material. When you're 20-something, you, you haven't got enough life under your belt to really be instructing at a quality level. Yet you can master the information. Yes, you can teach and be a, an instructor. But I speak to you, fathers, who have known him who was from the beginning. And it's basically having the Father's heart to say, I want to bring many sons to glory. Did Jesus have that? Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And he was the firstborn amongst many brethren because he wanted to bring many sons and daughters to glory. That's the heart of the Father. You want to see that. You want to see them grow up and stand on their own two feet and be proud of them. Because though I speak with the tongue of men and angels and have not love, I'm just a noisy sound. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries, and though I have all faith that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, I have not love. It profits me nothing. How many would say that those 10 M's would be a challenge to the average believer? Don't you think? I think it's healthy to and not put a religious condemnation on anybody, but to challenge them to promote character. That's really what we need, because there's going to be a collision, I'm telling you, between those who are gifted and are seeking power and selfish ambition, and those that are gifted that got character. So I say from this time on, we should be evaluating those 10 M's. Look at those 10 M's and say, where, where are they lacking? Because if if he makes the man before he makes mighty ministry, I'm going to look at their maturity level, not their gifting. I'm going to look at their ministry has no offense. There's no offense in the ministry. I'm going to look at the message to see if, are they speaking the truth in love or are they just speaking the truth? Big difference because one has a redemptive solution. The other one is just condemning. Their maturity do they have the right attitude in human relationships? 
And we've made excuses for this in the past. Well, you know, they're a prophet. They're just like that. That's not an excuse for them having moral character. That's not an excuse for them to not be more people-oriented. Jesus is in the people business. I'm sorry. There's people that are people people, and there's people that are not people people. But you are actually without excuse. You're going to have to learn. You're going to have to come out of your comfort zone and recognize that God's in the people business. There's that maturity. Then there's the marriage. And again, the primary thing is God first, wife second, family, then ministry. Why that gets turned around and nobody challenges that anymore. But that's, that's God's order. How's the marriage? Wasn't it Billy Graham that was uh, asked, what would you do different after he was up in age? And he said, I'd have prayed more and done less meetings. Hmm? In other words, the meetings were significant for the purposes of God, but there was meetings that apparently he took that he didn't have to take. Hmm? That he might have been better off spending time with the family. So it, there's a balance there. And you've got to be honest before God to know what is the motive. And God's basically going to bring us to the place where we're going to be concerned about that motive. So how many wrote down those 10 M's? Did you write them down? How many, if you evaluated yourself by those 10 M's, feel that we could have some work? Then this is Resurrection Sunday. <laughs> now don't, don't get sick on me now. <laughs> this is supposed to be uplifting. All right. But this is the beauty of it. That same power that raised Jesus from the dead will give life to your mortal body and he will rise up in any of those areas that you allow him. If you allow him, that resurrection life, that same life that raised Jesus from the dead will bring life in that portion of your body. All you have to do is say, in me, I want a work of the Holy Spirit to deal with money issues. I want him to deal with, uh, I mean, I get... We get emails and calls almost continually like, uh, uh, I'm financially devastated. Why didn't God have my back? But I saw in every case that they had happened, I believe that what David said, I once was young and now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous begging bread. If you're begging, there's something significantly that needs adjusted. You need a little reality therapy. All right. How has it been working for you if God guides, where, if he provides where he guides? How's it been working for you? If it's not working, perhaps you need an adjustment. And the first adjustment to consider is get a job. I remember that young man kept following uh, Denny up in New England. He, he wanted to be a prophet too, and he wanted a prophetic anointing. How do I increase my anointing? How? And he was trying to be very tactful. Do you know sometimes I think God doesn't want you to be too tactful. Do you believe that? I think sometimes they need to hear the right answer and don't beat around the bush. So he kept following. He said, what do I do to get more anointed? What do I get? He turned around and he says, get a job, get married, have kids, and your anointing will increase. <laughs> he asked for that one. Hmm? But he needed life experience. They want, I want more anointing, but... I don't know how to navigate in circumstances or with people. Guess what? That's all of life. Colossians 1.11. I'll tell you where, where there's an anointing. Try this one. To be, the New American Standard says, a walk that's worthy of the Lord being strengthened by his power in the inner man in steadfastness and patience with joy. Wait a minute. Steadfastness has to do with circumstances. Patience has to do with people and then with joy. Is that a supernatural work of God or what? That's all of life. Circumstances and people. If there's anything else, I don't know about it. Hmm? Steadfast in circumstances and patient with people with joy. Because there's, there's a lot of people think they're doing pretty good because they're coping. Or they're putting up with. But God's basically saying steadfast in circumstances, patient with people with joy. I mean, come on. Actually, when I was a young pastor, I had an older pastor tell me, Dennis, he said, you got to just lighten up a little bit. And he said, it's actually quite humorous. He said, there's never been any more entertainment than I've seen in the church. <laughs> and so I'm thinking about it. I'm going, 
Yeah, it gets kind of funny, some of the things they say and do. It, it is gets amusing. If you can't laugh at yourself, because he basically took, got me on the side and said, lighten up, Pharisee. <laughs> And that's what we ought to do. Lighten up a little bit, Pharisee. Guess what? This is the place where it's happening. Anybody that watches soap operas doesn't go to church. If you go to church, that's where the action is. That's where, that's where you see people dealing with their stuff. Do you ever see someone dealing with their stuff, what they look like? They should go look in the mirror when they're dealing with their stuff. They'd scare themselves. I don't know. I don't know. She, he, what they. You see all that demonic manifestation on their face? They should go look in the mirror. But anyway, it's where the action is, right? Are you one of those people that knows what's going on, where the action is? Or are you one of those people that hear about it secondhand? Or you don't know what's going on? All of the, if the way you answer those three questions basically determines where you are relationally. Hmm? Let's stand to our feet this morning. Those of you that are watching by Ustream, take those 10 M's and look over them for the rest of the week. And we're going to see if we can bring some life out of those slumbering spirits and, and get rid of the grave clothes and have some resurrection life, not just for Easter, but for the rest of your life. That same power that raised Jesus from the dead will quicken your mortal body. So, Father, we pray right now that out of those 10 M's that God search our hearts for anxious thoughts, hurtful ways. If there's anything in us that needs an adjustment, we're opening to the work of the Holy Spirit to adjust accordingly. Adjust accordingly. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.